could help. Yeah, grab that. The chair? Or the, sure. yeah, okay. Hi. <laughs> you too. Oh, no, that's yours. I don't know if you showed you how to put that on. There's another chair. Yeah, of course. Thank you. This one. Can you hear me on this mic? Oh, good. That wasn't too bad of a that wasn't too bad of a prop change. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, we have some gifts from the Truman Library, right? That surprised you, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this will not surprise the scholars and teachers in the audience, but we're going to give you both a copy of David McCullough's <laughs> Truman. Oh, thank you so much. Seems very appropriate. Thank you. And then I thought it was fun. <laughs> Both the Truman bumper stickers. I'm not sure if either of you are driving yet. Thank you. But you know, yeah. mom and dad might let you put that on the car Everywhere. too. Everywhere. Thank you. Okay, let me get comfortable here. So what we're gonna do is just spend a few minutes asking a few questions. I have to have my cheat sheet ready. You know, Erin was able to memorize her performance. I couldn't memorize my questions, so <laughs> shows you the scale of their research. I had more time. You had more time? Yeah. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> so I know I keep saying congratulations, but to both of you, really, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so um, just a couple of things, just to open up the conversation, and then we can open it up to the, the public as well. We've got a couple of microphones at the end of the, the stage here. In a few minutes, if you want to ask questions, you'd be welcome to do that. And just to start out, because of these amazing presentations, your performance and the exhibit, I wonder if both of you, and you, you touched on this a little already, Hannah, with your PowerPoint, but maybe just talk to us about kind of the layers of your research, how you went about researching your topic, and kind of what process you went through to do that. Maybe we'll start with you, Erin, okay. and then we'll switch to Hannah. Yeah, so my topic, I mean, it took place in the early 1900s of England, so I couldn't fly out there all the time. But, um, so the internet was really helpful for me because I had access to a lot of archives and a lot of sources online, including primary sources, which was really helpful. Um, so I ended up, I think I started at, um, on the UK Parliament website and I found the Cat and Mouse Act and I built from there. Sorry, I'm dropping things, but <laughs> yeah. And so then I rented a lot of books from the library. It was interesting too because even at the UMKC library, they had a lot of books that weren't other places. And so that was good because my sister was to UMKC. So I used her as a resource. <laughs> but um, yeah, I ended up buying a couple books as well. But the majority of my research took place online um, through newspaper articles, letters, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Very good. How about you, Hannah? Um, I did a lot of online research too. Um, my main goal is to find visually interesting um, resources so that it'll be fun to look at an exhibit. So I try to look for a big variety. And I actually had the ability to go to the Eisenhower Presidential Library in Kansas. And he had a lot of resources available there because um, like he was, um, had a lot of quotes and passed a lot of um, important documents. And so I could use those resources. And then I also used a lot of interviews with Corinne Wagner and Robert Edsel and people like that. And I, I, hate, I hate to put a number on it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> Approximately how many primary sources would you both say you had in your, your presentations? A lot. A lot. <laughs> my, um, okay, my annotated bibliography was 18 pages, and I think there's like 50 at least yeah. of that. I, Probably a similar number. I, I lost count after a long time. So. so lots and lots of primary sources and lots yeah. of different types of sources, right? Well, and the primary sources are so helpful too because, I mean, the secondary sources are great, but usually they'll come from um, a, a more modern perspective. And so with the primary sources, it allows for more interpretation on your part. So I think that's why I had to focus on those a bit, but yeah. I had a primary resource. It was a book written by James Rormer, and he published it in 1945. And so, very old, and it's not in print anymore. And there was only two of them in the United States. I was able to get one of them through interlibrary loan, and it was one of my favorite sources. So it was neat to hear his autobiography of his whole journey through Europe, and it was really beneficial to my research as well. So Hannah's answered my next question. <laughs> so that's always good, right? So was there a particularly surprising or cool source that either of you found, you kind of half answered that. I talked about the Cat and Mouse Act a little bit, um, yeah. but so it was cool to see the actual document because you could see that there was clearly a lot of bias um, even in this historical document. 
And I thought that that was interesting because I had previously assumed that you know they would try and keep a lot of bias out of it. Um, but no, it was there, and it was great. <laughs> but yeah, and there were a lot of letters that were really helpful to me as well. And there was one book, and it wasn't a primary source, but um, it was called Suffragette Sally, and it was really interesting. Yeah. How about the particular category? As I mentioned at the outset, you know, students can do a website or a paper or an exhibit or performance or a paper. So why an exhibit? Um, you don't have to perform in front of people. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Except tonight, right? Except yeah. tonight you did. Um, I love scrapbooking. My mom scrapbooks, so that kind of lends me to pick that category. And I like to be creative with my hands, so I've always just, it wasn't a question like, hmm, which category should I do? It was a done deal right from yeah. the outset. All right. How about you, Aaron? Um, I mean, I've been like doing theater since I was very young. And so when I looked into National History Day for the first time and there was a performance category, I never even questioned it. Um, and I love writing too, which is really cool because you get to write your script and it's, I don't know, it's a very different experience from the theater that I've done because you're embodying historical figures and so it's up to you to do all of the research that creates that internal monologue um, and I just found that really fascinating, but yeah. So I'm going to ask you both the same question, but it's going to be a little different because of the formats you use. So in terms of putting together your performance or together your exhibit, you have to think about the display and the color scheme and, and props to a certain degree, but how you're going to design your exhibit. And for you, for your performance, stitching that together and that English accent that I recognized, <laughs> right? <laughs> so talk to me about the accent and how do, you, how do you develop that as a performer? And maybe for you, Hannah, when we come to your turn, talk to me about what the design scheme. We talked a little about the salt mine and that feeling, but other things that went into that. Maybe the, the accent first, because I'm dying to hear this. <laughs> oh, I'm so scared now, but <laughs> yeah, so. Um, you don't have to do the accent again. Okay, so that's, that's good, good, that's good. But yeah, no, so I wanted it to be historically accurate as much as possible and still um, be able to be clear enough to be understood. And so with Edith Garrett, it's hard because um, since she was a woman of the time period, though she was an influential historical figure, in my opinion, there are not a lot of interviews with her. And I did find one. But, well, I mean, I found written interviews, but there were not a lot of um, interviews that we still have access to today. But um, from what I heard and from what I researched about her life and how she moved and where she was born, I was sort of able to figure it out from there. And she was of a similar class, so, okay. <laughs> so um, she was a real historical figure, but Florence was a fictional character who embodied a realistic historical perspective of the time period. And so, there were many different perspectives, and she, of course, Florence was, of course, pro-suffrage, but against the use of militant tactics to achieve it. And so they were of um, a similar class, but different ages, so I just sort of wanted to try and create a little bit of a distinction there. Yeah. Very good. Um, with the exhibits, the main challenge is you have a 500-word limit. And so that's where telling the story through quotes or through your images is really important. So I'm always looking for documents that help to make my point without me using any of my word limit. And whenever, as far as the design concepts, this year I knew from the start I wanted to make a salt mine. It just, I didn't know how I was going to do that. And so I kind of revised it as I went along between the competitions, adding in more aspects to try to convey that idea. And another thing you consider with exhibits is you want people to be able to walk up and get a main idea really quickly. And so over the years creating my exhibits, I've kind of figured out a system of put the thesis here and here's how to logically transition it and still make it interesting for the viewer. So that's kind of what I think about while I'm designing it. I should say, I know the exhibits are out there for the reception. Hannah brought five years of exhibits today. Um, so that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that tells me is she's really into cultural preservation because she presents <laughs> yeah. the exhibits. But two, um, the, the, the transition you've gone through in creating those exhibits, I think, and you both participated in National History Day before. I kind of have inside knowledge about before. that. Um, but tell me, why, you, why would both, you, I know in the past you've both placed in the top three previously in National History Day. I know this is both the first time you've finished first, but why do it again after you've already finished second or third in the previous years? Why do it again or why, why, why do it again? <laughs> That's my question. Um, so I started competing in the junior division um, my seventh grade year and this was my third year so I competed seventh and eighth grade and then this year so there was a little bit of a gap in between um, but I always really enjoyed it and 
Um, I actually didn't think I would ever place, so that was really exciting. Um, my eighth grade year, um, I got second in the junior division for performance. But after that, I really wanted to do it again, but you know, I started high school and I was very busy and I didn't know how I could work it in. But then, you know, every year um, comes the time of the national competition and, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my gosh, they're all there and I just wish I was there with them. Because it's such a cool experience to be surrounded by all these people that are so interested in history because that's so rare to find. And I mean, you can go up, and I, I've talked about this, but you can go up to a random stranger and be like, do you like Hamilton? And <laughs> the answer is likely going to be yes. And so I that's was, most teenage conversations, right? In my world. <laughs> but it was just, I think um, there, were, there was a year or two where I wasn't at the competition, and it wasn't even about winning or placing anymore. It was just I really wanted to experience it again, and I didn't know if I would have another opportunity, so I felt that this had to be um, one of my last years that I did it, and I, it's something that once you enter, it's hard to walk away from because it's such an incredible experience. Yeah. Um, whenever I started participating in National History Day in eighth grade, it was required for one of my school assignments. So that year I didn't have a choice, but it was one of the most enjoyable times of middle school, and whenever I went on to high school and didn't have that class offered anymore, I decided to keep doing it outside of school because I couldn't imagine not participating um, National History Day has given me so many opportunities, especially because I want to be a museum curator now, um, getting to have my project in museums and talking to people in that field. Um, just that experience, you don't want to turn, up an turn off an opportunity to do that. And like Aaron said, it's even, as soon as I'd start to think, oh, maybe I won't have time to do it this year, senior year, super busy, I'd think, what am I going to feel like on regionals or state or nationals, and I'm not there trying to compete. So I've always just had to come back and do it. Now we have about approximately 50 teachers here tonight, maybe a few more than that actually. Um, for them, who might be thinking about having their students getting involved in History Day, what would you say were the benefits of History Day that their students could get from participating? I need to give you a really long list, but, <laughs> oh gosh, there are, wait, do I go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. You're the performer, Aaron, you get to go first. I keep talking, I'm so That's sorry. Okay. But, oh my gosh, the, the benefits are endless. I mean, okay, first of all, this, for me at least, fostered such an interest in history that I didn't know I had previously. I mean, I, I was always interested in, in class, but there aren't a lot of opportunities to get involved, especially as a young person. And through this competition, I, I mean, it opened my eyes to so much regarding our history and our future. Um, and I reiterate this all the time, but I think it's so important to look at our history because regardless of you, whatever you believe, if it's that history repeats itself or if it rhymes, um, right. th you, there are always going to be patterns. And so when we're educating a group of young people, of young citizens and students, we have to make sure that we're teaching them what choices uh, have been made and what choices we can make in the future in order to better our society as a whole. And I think that this creates a generation of not only historians, but of well-informed citizens that are going to be able to actually go out and make a difference in our world. I'm going to pause. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, the benefits of National History Day are so hard to count as well. Um, just the opportunities because of my future career to like those specific things, getting to work in a, or have an internship at the Truman Library or have my exhibits in museums and meet people like that um, specifically relates to me. But even just National History Day forces you to get outside your comfort zone. And I've so enjoyed getting to do that. And like going and researching in archives or coming to the Truman Library and learning more about something that you don't know more about. And it's just been a really great experience. And, I know it's going to help you a lot in college, too. You learn how to research and how to write papers and how to talk to people that you don't know. And I'm just, there's so many benefits. I could go on. But. So I have kind of a, a catchphrase for History Day that you guys may not have heard of, but I often say that History Day students become the educators. And do you think that's true? I mean, have they educated you tonight? <laughs> right? Erin chose a topic that was pretty well unknown for 99% of the population. And although the Monuments movie came out recently, I know Hannah had had that idea of doing that before the movie came out, but she really went depth, in depth on that topic when you wouldn't have otherwise seen that knowledge. Um, so that, that, that phrase rings true for me. The students become the educators. They tell you about 
things that you may know something about, but they go in such great depth with their research that you guys become the educators, which is what teachers want, right? So I think that's a really powerful statement. Just to wrap things up before we turn to the public to ask their questions, maybe tell us your future plans. I know you're going to be going into a senior year, but what are you thinking about after, after high school? So <laughs> I have a lot of plans that might change because I'm interested in a lot of things, but I definitely want to um, go to college and study history and then possibly double in international relations and then minor in theater, dance, physics, or astronomy, and then I want to, uh, <laughs> I would like to get a PhD in history and then ideally I'd like to work for the UN and then become a motivational speaker and then a professor and like write all this. <laughs> Does anybody doubt that she would do all that? <laughs> It could so, change. Just, so you're not very ambitious then. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful answer. How about you, Hannah? Um, so I'm going to be going to Truman State University this fall, and I want to be a museum curator, like I said, or something similar in a museum field. And I'm also going to minor in his or minor in Spanish, major history. And then future plans also. I would say I want to stay involved with National History Day. So like I've told Mark and Maggie, I want to volunteer and eventually become a judge in the contest and help to have other students have the same experience that I've had with the program. Uh, yeah, I should say that Hannah has been mentoring some of the students in the middle school in her school district in Odessa mm -hmm. as part of that. Um, just to, to wrap things up, um, just I, because I was very, very fortunate to be at the National Awards Ceremony and these two young ladies were sitting next to <laughs> yeah. each other. They were sitting next to each other in this huge basketball arena where University of Maryland play, the new arena that's what, Infinity Center, that would mm have -hmm. been open about 10 years. So it's state-of-the-art uh, basketball uh, arena, and they're sitting next to each other in the audience. So what I want you to go through, this is going to be fun. So when they made the announcement for your category, kind of retell what, what, what was going through your mind as they were saying, you know, senior individual performance, third place, second place, senior individual exhibit, third place. You must have a story for that. What do, yeah. you, what do, you, do you remember any of it? Because well, it was such a blur, right? Yeah, we were sitting next to each other. And, um, you know, so they never announce performance first. They never do. And this It's time, random. Like, you don't know which category is yeah. first or second. So. And this time, they're like, performance. And so I'm like, oh, great. I didn't have time to freak out internally, like usual. And so... <laughs> <laughs> And so we were sitting next to each other, and like we grab hands, and we're like, okay, yeah. okay, we did this for both categories. Um, and so they announced third, and I, I mean, we, uh, well, like, uh, you, we both knew that we'd made top ten at that point, right? I don't know. Oh, okay. I knew that I'd made top ten at that point because I had to perform again the day before, two days before, or something, or the day before, yes. And um, so I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be tenth. That's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna get last. And and um, I had just accepted this. And then I was like, there, there's no way I could, I could place, but if I do, it might be third, right? And so then they, they start announcing, and I'm like, okay, okay. And I started like, whispering to her, I'm like, I know who won. It's like this person. And um, then, so I'd given up all hope, and they called my name. And um, well, first they were like from Kansas City, Missouri, and we started freaking out. We didn't even hear them announce my name. And <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I won. But you had to go to And so also at the award ceremony, there's this big thing, and it's kind of like the Olympics, and all the affiliates have their flags and everything. And so the Missouri State Insect is the honeybee. So we had these antennae um, that we were wearing on our heads. And so when they called my name, I was so overwhelmed, I forgot to take them off. <laughs> when I ran down to the stage and they were trying to like put the metal on and I, it was, there was a very awkward moment on the camera footage, but yeah. Take them off, put the metal on, it was fine. Yeah. Someone came up to me afterwards and they're like, you're Antenna Girl, and I was like. Antenna yeah. Girl? <laughs> well, that's yeah, good. and then, yeah, when you went. And then later on, it was, what, maybe an hour later? Because it's a long Long enough. It's oh, a long It was the worst yeah. waiting. So Erin was one of the very first categories, and then Hannah was much, much later. So how was your experience? So I didn't know if I'd made finals or not. For exhibits, they don't announce that. So you have no idea if you're top three, top ten, or clear back like 106. <laughs> that you don't find out. So they announced my category and they said third, and then they said second, and normally they would announce first and then display on the screen a list of the finalists, who were the top ten, but it's just a random order on the screen. And for my category, they announced third, it wasn't me, second, it wasn't me, and I was like, giving up all hope, you don't think it could be you, and then the finalist popped up on the screen. And so it was like this moment of panic, why is this up there, this shouldn't be up there yet, and I see my name. So then I'm like, wait, did I make, like, could I still get first? So I'm counting them super quick and like talking to Aaron, like, what's this mean? And then they called it and it was just like tears mentally. Like I was so happy and it was kind of like an impossible goal for me because I'd 
Well, you always dream of getting first, but there's so many other things that are more important about National History Day than placing. But it was just so exciting for me. To, it was a great way to end my National History Day journey with that. Excellent. So what I'd like to do, if you'd like to ask a question, come to the microphones at either side of the stage. And hopefully, that I, do I need to turn those on? Ed? <laughs> I think I need to turn them on. Hang on one second. We're already turned on. Go for, yeah, there we go. All right. Go for it. Um, so this was kind of touched on in terms of the topics you guys chose. My question is, um, you guys chose kind of broad topics, but then got kind of a niche in it. Was that intentional? What's the process of choosing your topic for those who might not be familiar with the process? This year was the hardest year for me to choose a topic. I knew I wanted something recent enough where I'd have a lot of visual resources, but other than that, I was really stuck on what to choose. And so. Um, one of the local ladies from the DAR suggested when, when I was at their meeting, hey, what about the Monuments Men? And so I looked into it and watched the movie. I hadn't watched it yet and was like, this is the one for me. But it was a really big challenge for me narrowing that down because there's five million art, artworks. How do I pick, do I pick one artwork? Do I pick one person? And finally I decided upon doing the whole group but focusing just on specifically how they took a stand for cultural preservation. And it was still a challenge to narrow that down to the 500 words and there's so many more stories you could tell with it, but um, I was really happy with finally getting it narrowed down to where I did. So I did this two years in the past and the first year I had a very, very broad topic and it was the Trail of Tears and then the second year um, I had, um, a, like, a, not a smaller topic, but more of a niche topic, um, and it was the repatriation, which was, were actually legal deportations, but that's another story, um, of Mexican-American citizens during the Great Depression. And so that wasn't something that people had heard a lot about, and so I kind of experienced it both ways, um, having a broader topic, and um, the first year, it was still great, I still made it to nationals and everything, but the second year, because not a lot of people knew about my topic. I was able to go so much more in depth and it was so exciting to be able to tell people about something that you know they'd never heard of before. And so that's what I was looking for this year because also there are so many more research resources that have been, um, that are sort of untouched when you have a topic that not a lot of people know about. So it's not required or anything, but it kind of makes it more fun. So I mean, like when I came up with my topic, I was skipping down the halls of my school for like two weeks, like telling everyone about suffragitsu, and um, <laughs> people were probably not happy about that, but it was, it was so interesting to me. And yeah, I think it's, it's cool to be able to find a topic that you're really passionate about, and so if it's something specific, that's great. If it's not, that great, that's great too. But um, either way, just dive in. <laughs> To kind of add to that, once you find a topic, all your friends know about it because you'll go around and you're researching. And you're like, look at this. You won't believe what they said. Like, how could they do this? And you always love to talk about your topic with other people. And then specifically with the Monuments Men, most people either haven't heard of them or if they have, it's from the Monuments Men movie. And so I tried to, in my project, um, try to show the inaccuracies in the movie and try to prove um, how those were misrepresented and kind of dramatized by Hollywood. So I was kind of also working to um, show the truth behind the story as well. Derek? Uh, this one's for you, Hannah. I noticed that your exhibits are basically all the same size and dimension where you can make them whatever shape that you want to as long as it fits within the required size. And I think that yours are even smaller than the required mm -hmm. size. So I want to know how you decided to go about the construction of the actual board itself and um, uh, well that's basically it. Why, why, why you wanted to do it that particular way. Oh and I remember if you, not as important, but how did you get it to DC? How did you mail it or whatever? Okay. So in eighth grade whenever I started um, my teacher Miss Hawk had these those exhibit frames. So like my penicillin project it's the wood frame and I covered the inserts. It has inserts inside of it and I would cover those with fabric. And so that would allow her to reuse them for each um, class each year so that she wouldn't have to buy new boards. And once I decided to do it on my own I worked together with a local cabinet maker to help build the frames that were that exact size. And I went ahead and stuck with, stuck with that design just because I liked how you could see all the panels versus a rotating exhibit where you couldn't see everything at once. And I liked the height of it because sometimes whenever it gets really tall, it's hard to see personally, I think. So that's why I stuck with that design. 
Um, and then getting the project to DC, we had looked into shipping it my first year, but that is way too much money, like 500 bucks to get it there, especially with my Rosie the Riveter project where it was, has steel inserts, so it weighs a lot. And so we've just always drove out there and I buy lots of bubble wrap and saran wrap and I'll bubble wrap it here to the moon and back so it stays safe. <laughs> and then like my first year, whenever I walked into nationals, we got on the elevator and I sat it down and heard this awful crack noise. And one of the frames had broke, so duct tape comes in handy too. Like, <laughs> but usually it works out pretty well transporting them. Anything else from the, the audience? Well, let's give both students a rousing <laughs> applause. I'm going to finish with kind of that word from your sponsor, okay? <laughs> so I do want to re reiterate that the, the History Day program here at the Truman Library for the last 20 years has been funded by the Truman Library Institute. And so that's if you're considering membership to various organizations, I would really advocate for Truman Library Institute membership so that they can fund all of our educational programs, including our teachers that are here this week and History Day and some of our other educational programs as well. And then. Um, I would um, really also like to thank, the, I mentioned at the outset in the introductions, the State of Strong Center, Missouri. They're based out of Columbia um, and they run the state program but also help all of the regional directors throughout the year. And I recognize Maggie Mahan earlier as the state coordinator. But they do have local offices in St. Louis and in Kansas City. And so you can use their resources from those locations. So those two partners, the Truman Library, the federal government here hosting the competition every year for 20 years. The funding from the Truman Library Institute and from the State Historical Society at the state level are really what helps the program. It funds the breakfast for the judges, it, it helps put on workshops, it funds our food for tonight, all of those things that are behind the scenes. That, that doesn't happen without the support of those agencies. So I would like you to bear that in mind um, as these cultural things are put under threat at the federal level. Just remember that support for National Endowment of Humanities supports uh, the State Historic Society of Missouri from the Missouri H Humanities Council. National Endowment for the Arts certainly funds many performance things throughout the country. Those funds are under threat right now, and I'd just like to leave that thought with you as we applaud once again these two students. Incredible <laughs> achievement. And finally, I would just like to thank you for coming and spending your Thursday night with us and appreciate that. And uh, have a yeah. great evening. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for coming.